Welcome on this beautiful Sunday afternoon. Um, we have a treat for you today, and I'm sure so many of you have been looking forward to hearing Dr. William Ferris and his talk about the civil rights movement and focusing on photography um, in 1960 and 1970. We want to remind you of a wonderful um, presentation tomorrow, and that's by Dr. Ferris's wife, Dr. Marcy Cohen Ferris, and that is going to focus on her new book, Edible North Carolina, A Journey Across a State of Flavor. So that'll be at 12 o'clock tomorrow in Walnut 101, and hopefully it'll whet your appetite for a late lunch to go to. So we're delighted to have you today, and we're very honored to have uh, Emily Will, which we all know and uh, understand she's such an advocate for the arts and humanities, as well as a historian in her own right. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Charlotte, and thank all of you for being here. I think you're in for a treat, and actually, I had such a good time researching Bill or William R. Ferris's biography that I could take a full hour telling you about him, but I'll try to, be, uh, to restrain myself. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that out of the usual format for an introduction, I'd like to tell you two important things right off the top. He was appointed by President Bill Clinton in 1997 to be the chairman of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and he served in that capacity for four years. If you knew nothing else, that would be impressive, I think. Another thing that was fairly impressive to me um, was that he, the Rolling Stone, which is a magazine publication from California, listed him as one of the 10 best professors in the entire United States. Now that alone could be uh, enough of an introduction, but I'll just give you that to tease you a little bit. Um, I'll briefly say he's one of five children from Vicksburg, Mississippi, and um, that he attended public schools there until he was ready to go to high school. And then he was accepted at Brooks School, which I'd never heard of, in Andover, Massachusetts. And um, apparently this is where people like the Kelloggs and the Hines and all these people whose names you've heard go to school. I think we could probably talk all hour about that if I knew a little bit more. Then he went to Davidson after he uh, graduated from high school, and he was in North Carolina for four years. Uh, he got a degree in English literature. Then he went to Northwestern uh, University, and then he went to Trinity College, which has been there since the 1500s, in Dublin, Ireland, where the Book of Kells is, and was there for a year to study and came back to the University of Massachusetts, where he got another master's and his PhD. And at that time, he decided maybe he'd better have a profession. So he began by teaching in Mississippi for a couple of years at Jackson State. And then he went to Yale University as a teacher for seven years. Um, probably teacher is not the right word, but professor of uh, Afro-American studies. And while he was there, he founded the Center for Southern Folklore. And then he went to the University of Mississippi at Oxford for about eight years. And he founded that while he was there, he was a founding director of the Center for the Study of Southern Culture. And then in 2002, he came to North Carolina where he's been ever since. We're very fortunate to have him. He came as a faculty senior associate director of the Center for the Study of the American South and a professor of history and of the curriculum of folklore. Um, so that's really all I'm going to take time to say, except that he's written 10 books, edited six, produced 15 documentaries, recorded albums, hosted 
a weekly public radio show for 10 years, and um, his work is on display at the Smithsonian, which you may have heard of, and has been in the New York Times. So I think you get the idea. It's been nominated for a Pulitzer Prize as well. I think I've taken enough time, but I, I think we're extremely fortunate to have Bill Ferris with us this evening, and I hope you enjoy him as much as I. He's a very nice guy. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Emily. That's a, a wonderful introduction, and I hope I can live up to a little of it. Uh, it's a great honor for my wife, Marcy, and me to be on the Wayne College Community College campus here. It's a beautiful uh, area, and we're looking forward to learning a lot more about the programs while we're here. And the Wayne Community College Foundation for the Arts and Humanities series is really a model for what every community should aspire to. I especially want to thank Charlotte Brow and Kay Cook for having worked diligently through COVID. It's been four or five years. We've been trying to figure out when Marcy and I could both make this trip. And finally, today and tomorrow, we are here and we are thrilled to be with you all. They say many hands make light work, and I want to mention some of the other hands. Adrian Northington, who's the director of the uh, College Foundation, has, as you well know, deep roots in this community. Her father, Lindsey Warren, was a fourth-generation lawyer and legislator who worked with uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt at the national level and here in North Carolina revamped the whole legal system. And we feel like we've come to be with family with David and Emily Wheel. Uh, Marcy for the past uh, 20 years has taught a course on Southern Jewish history at the University of North Carolina. And the highlight of that course, and I've been privileged to come with her on some of those uh, groups, is to come to Goldsboro and to get a personal led tour by David and Emily. And we, we got to see projects that you and they have put together, like the Paramount Theater, fabulous theater, and the Oleg Shalom Community Soup Kitchen, which is doing the work of the future. We need to feed people, and that's exactly what they're doing. And they have endowed the annual Wheel Lecture at the University of North Carolina that when we attended it, Marcy and I, in 2017, we were privileged to hear uh, Goldsboro's very own Reverend William Barber, one of the greatest talks that I've ever heard. It brought the house down. We're also privileged to be in the presence of our old and dear friends, Laurel and Charlie Sneed, who've done deep research and work in North Carolina history and culture I've known Laurel for many years in her role as executive director of the Thomas Day Educational Project. It's a model project on North Carolina history. Goldsboro is known, there must be something in the water here that produces some of the nation's finest voices in civil rights and social activism. Uh, in David's family, the name Gertrude Wheel is known throughout the nation. She led the suffrage movement here in North Carolina. Ruth Whitehead Whaley, the first black woman to practice law in New York State. Dr. John Hope Franklin, who married Aurelia Whittington Franklin at her home here on James Street. 
Dorothy Cotton, the only female member of Dr. King's inner circle, and of course, Reverend William Barber, nationally known as an activist and religious leader who has served as pastor of the Greenleaf Christian Church on North William Street for 30 years. And last but not least, I'm going to share with you what the Cajuns call lanyap. That's a, a Cajun word. It means it's a little gift you didn't expect, a little extra, but you're going to be happier than ever. You got it. I am joined here tonight, as are we all, by my former student and dear friend, Mary D. Williams, folklorist, gospel singer, and teacher. Mary is a UNC performing folklorist and adjunct at Duke University and Wake Technical Community College. She was my student when she did her master's degree in folklore at the University of North Carolina. And I have to say, I think I learned more from Mary than she learned from me. She's a great teacher. And she did her MA there, and I recruited her to work on an exhibition called I Am a Man of photographs from the American South of the Civil Rights Movement during the 60s. And it was commissioned by a French museum in Montpellier uh, called the Pavillon Populaire. They asked me, the director, Gilles Morin, is an old friend, and he asked me if I would curate it. And I naively agreed to, not knowing it would take over my life and still does. It's a powerful testament. The vision was to create a memorial of that decade to Dr. King 50 years after his death. Well, it turned out that those photographs coincided with Black Lives Matter. And when it opened in France, I went with 50 American guests that included James Meredith, whom you will see in the photographs, the first black student to enter the University of Mississippi. It included also five distinguished scholars from the United States, joined by five French scholars who spoke about the civil rights movement at a symposium. And Mary was one of those five. She sang and spoke and brought the house down. You would have been so proud to think that a Goldsboro voice was getting global attention during that opening. That exhibit a few years later opened at the Mississippi Civil Rights Museum in Jackson. And today it's traveling for the next six years to museums all over the nation. Now I'm going, and I called Mary just to show you what a friend she is this afternoon at her home in Graham. And I said, Mary, I just want to get your permission to mention you in my comments. She said, when is it? I said, it's at five. She said, I'm coming. And I said, well, if you come, I want to dedicate this program to you, and I want you to open it with one of your beautiful hymns. Mary, will you please come up and join us? And we have a, uh, a microphone right here. Please join me in welcoming Mary Williams.
Jesus. They say that freedom is a constant struggle. songs to reinforce them and secure them while they were sitting in weighed in situations that were perilous but they stood steadfast and allowed songs to bring resolution in terms of just kind of calm them and unite them and build a community this may be my last time this may be my last time, children. This may be my last time. It may be my last time. I don't know. It may be the last time we march together. It may be the last time. I don't know. Maybe the last time we sing together, it may be the last time I don't know. This may be my last time. Come on. This may be my last time, children. This may be my last time it may be my last time i don't know now y'all know this this may be my last time that's it this may be my last time very good this may be my well it may be my last time i don't know one more time this may be my Come on. This may be my Oh, this may be my Well, it may be my last time. I don't know. Well, it may be the last time we sing together. It may be my last time. I don't know. It may be my last time we sing together. It may be my last time. I don't, oh, this may be my last Oh, this may be my last Oh, this may be my last Well, it may be my last I Mary D. Williams. Thank you, Mary. The last time we did that was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I gave a talk there. They had no idea she was coming. And she brought that house down. Mary, you're a blessing to all of us. And thank you for making this trip. 
you see how proud we are of Goldsboro and how many hands, like the many patches in a quilt, form a work of art, which is what you do here. With the kind of leadership you have, anything is possible. I'm going to speak with you about these photographs, and I thought I would start by just giving you a sense of what I've done over the years. Uh, we did an encyclopedia of Southern culture, which the University of North Carolina Press published. It made over a million dollars for them, and I have to say it's the number two best-selling book they've published. The number one best-selling book is Mama Dip's Cookbook. That puts you in line when you know that food is where it is the top of the line, and tomorrow Marcy will be speaking about that. Uh, I am very interested, more and more so, in photography. Marcy and I watched the evening news last night, tragic report from Wynn, Arkansas. She grew up in Arkansas near there. And they interviewed a couple standing on the edge of their home, which they had been in when that tornado destroyed it, totally destroyed. And they said they were looking for things that they wanted to keep for the memories that they held dear. And the interviewer said, well, what kind of things hold those memories for you? They said, photographs. Now, I know without going into any of your homes, if I went into your home and looked on the walls and tables, there would be photographs of family, of friends, of homes, of places that are close to your heart. And in my work in folklore, I often talk about memory and sense of place, what Faulkner called the little postage stamp of native soil that anchors you as a people. Uh, Adrian said she came back here from Winston-Salem. She came back to that postage stamp. And the photograph does that better than anything else. You look at a photograph and all of a sudden you're right back at that moment when you took it or with that person that it evokes. So photographs are very important, as are our great writers. And this is a work I did on writers like Alice Walker and Eudora Welty. Eudora was also a great photographer. And those are the people and the memories that folklore preserves. And I am a folklorist. And the music is very important. We own the 20th century. The South owns it. In terms of music and literature, the writers like Randall Keenan of North Carolina, Thomas Wolfe, Tennessee Williams, Richard Wright, Alice Walker, all of these great writers, and in music, Jimmy Rogers, the father of country music, B.B. King, the great blues artist, uh, Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll, and the list goes on from blues and gospel and country music to hip hop and rap. The music is also an anchor of memory. And uh, about 10 years ago, we put together something I'd never heard of called a box set. And a group in Atlanta, a couple, Lance and April Ledbetter, spent 10 years going through my archive, which is in Wilson Library at UNC. And they pulled four CDs and DVDs, a CD of blues, of gospel, of stories, and a DVD of my documentary films, and uh, a book, which ended up winning uh, two Grammy Awards, 
And it's now a traveling musical production that was at Lincoln Center this past year and is traveling around the country. But the photographs that we're talking about tonight are not my photographs. They are photographs as designed by the vision of Gilles Morat in Montpellier, France, to be a collection that would memorialize the civil rights movement of the 60s in the South, that would draw on the famous photographers uh, that are well known and those that have never been heard of. Danny Lyon is really a well-known photographer, but others did work for a local newspaper and just happened to be there when moments were captured in the photographs. I am a man, and those photographs, like the fabled songs and stories of the American South, bear witness to the region's past, to its people, and to the places that shaped their lives. They are vessels of truth that capture the courage of protesters who faced unimaginable violence and brutality, the quiet determination of elders, and the angry commitment of the young. These photographs were a wedge in the segregated South during the decade from 1960 to 1970. They document a historic period that unleashed hope for the future and profound change as public spaces, like the space in which we are meeting, were desegregated and blacks secured the vote. These photographs are also a significant backdrop for the transformative Black Lives Matter movement in America today. We remember photographs of protesters who carried signs with messages like, I am a man, and sat at segregated lunch counters as iconic, familiar images associated with the civil rights movement. Civil rights organizations recognize the power of photography to publicize their efforts and to secure support for their movement. The Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC, hired photographer Danny Lyons to document their struggle. His photographs dramatically illustrated the movement's ideology as seen in his visceral images of posters held aloft by the civil rights movement and protesters saying, come, let us build a new world together and one man, one vote. Lyons recalled how his arrival in Jackson, Mississippi reminded him of traveling to South Africa. As he said, when the DC-8 landed in Jackson, I might as well have been stepping off in Johannesburg. Everything frightened me. I was suppo supposed to take a colored cab into a colored neighborhood, but it was illegal for black drivers to carry white passengers. And needless to say, I couldn't ask a white driver to take me to look for civil rights workers. Eventually, I persuaded some black driver to take me to the address I had been given for the Freedom House the occupants of which told me I was at the wrong address. The Freedom House was next door. Just as black and white protesters joined arms to march and sit in 
the photographers were also black and white. These photographers covered local communities like Chapel Hill, Memphis, and Jackson for local newspapers that featured their work. Photographers of the American Civil Rights Movement are visual monuments, their photographs are, that stand the test of time, and they will never, ever be forgotten. They are a powerful reminder that the past is never past, that lessons learned in one period, the decade of 1960 to 70, help us move forward in the global struggle for justice today. Look at the faces and their expressions as they register to vote as they desegregate a lunch counter, as they march, the viewer feels their intense sense of conviction, their courage and invincibility. They are part of the long quest for racial justice that dates from 1619 to the present. 19th century abolitionist and anti-slavery writer Frederick Douglass recognized the importance of photography and photographs for black people who sought freedom and full citizenship as Americans. The most photographed American in his era Douglas lectured on how black lives are honored and preserved through photographs. The first photograph of Douglas was a daguerreotype, and he sat for 160 photograph portraits, more than Abraham Lincoln, during his lifetime. In his lecture on pictures, Douglas argued that the great discoverer of modern times to whom coming generations will award special homage will be Daguerre. What was once the special and exclusive luxury of the rich and great is now the privilege of all. The humblest servant girl may now possess a picture of herself such as the wealth of kings could not purchase 50 years ago. Douglas believed that the daguerreotype dignified former enslaved people as the fully realized human beings they were. North Carolina's Randall Keenan grew up not far from Greensboro, a great writer of the state and the nation who makes extensive use of photography in his short story collection, Let the Dead Bury the Dead. In the short story this far, a photograph of Booker T. Washington inspires a reflection on Washington and his relationship to black liberation. The photograph was taken by Benjamin Johnson in 1906, and Randall Keenan writes, those light eyes, the arched eyebrow, the full nose, the prominent elfin ears, the Indian lips, the word handsome is impeached by integrity. Look at the dark flesh under the eyes. Here's a man who has spent many a sleepless night poring over documents and papers to make men free. Photographer Art Shea documented James Meredith, the first black student to enroll at the all-white University of Mississippi. He photographed Meredith 
and the 3,000 troops sent by President John Kennedy to protect him. Shea recalls how cameras at the ready, I found myself covering a homegrown war in which, to my horror, I saw the enemy as people like me, who thought the whiteness of their skin gave them a better birthright to America than the dark people had. It became the job of photojournalists like me to report what was happening as we watched. Within the history of photography, images of the civil rights movement mark a distinct body of work. Many of these photographs were taken in the midst of violent, dangerous confrontations between local whites and civil rights workers who risked their lives to engage in nonviolent civil disobedience. Inspired by the voice of Reverend Martin Luther King, Jr., thousands of courageous people risked their lives to end Jim Crow segregation within the American South. As a student during the 60s, I deeply identified with the civil rights movement. And the photographs that brought these events home to me as an American, as a Southerner. And my own work as a folklorist who documented black and white worlds in the South was shaped and inspired by these photographs and their power. They were a catalyst for moving history forward. Who would not be touched by the sight of people attacked simply because they wish to vote, to eat, to study in a public facility? They forced, the photographs did, the viewer to decide whether they were with or against the change that was unstoppable. They were a catalyst that challenged the daily lives of all of us at the grassroots. It is said that when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe in 1862, he remarked, quote, so you're the little woman who wrote the book that made this great war. Just as Stowe's novel, Uncle, Com uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, stirred outrage against slavery, these photographs inspired support for the civil rights movement around the world. Images of neatly dressed college-age demonstrators tear-gassed and beaten on the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, Alabama, taken by Spider Martin, of an effigy of James Meredith hung from a rope at the University of Mississippi, taken by Art Shea, and the body of Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. as it lay in state in Memphis, taken by Ernest Withers, galvanized opposition to Jim Crow apartheid in the American South. Ernest Withers' photographs of demonstrators holding I am a man signs affirm that black lives truly do matter. These images pull back the invisibility and reveal the humanity of black men, women, and children who marched and sang freedom songs to affirm their full citizenship as Americans almost 60 years ago. While photographing the funeral of Medgar Evers in Jackson, Mississippi in 1963, James Meredith was there and uh, Ed, Ernest Withers recalled as he was photographing, I was standing on the sidewalk taking one horrible scene after the other amid the screams 
Suddenly, a burly white man walked over to me and snatched me into the street. The force of the movement took the top off of my camera. As I tried to retrieve it, a policeman came over and began beating me with a nightstick and ushering me toward the truck. So we can see from Mary how music was a powerful force for organizing the strikes like I Am a Man that were photographed so powerfully by Ernest Withers, the sanitation strike in Memphis where Dr. King was murdered and the music that followed to galvanize the demonstrators included uh, a powerful group of freedom songs sung by Bernice Johnson Reagan and the SNCC Freedom Singers. They were joined by legendary singers like Sam Cooke, the Staple Singers, Pete Seeger, and Bob Dylan, who sang at civil rights events. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. had a special love for Mahalia Jackson's gospel music, and she inspired his I Have a Dream speech at the Lincoln Memorial when she told them, tell them about the dream, Martin. Tell them about the dream. The anthem of the civil rights movement, We Shall Overcome, was adapted from a traditional black spiritual by Pete Seeger. Seeger explained how he change the will to shall. I think it opens up the mouth better, he said, and within one month it spread throughout the South. It was the favorite song at the founding convention of SNCC three weeks later in April in Raleigh, North Carolina in 1960, where people came from throughout the South. Photographers who grew up in the South were well aware of the danger they faced when they approached demonstrators and police. Charles Moore, a Florida native, recalled how, as a born and bred Southerner, I was often shocked at the behavior of some people in places like Selma, Birmingham, Oxford, and St. Augustine, their faces contorted in anger, threatened me and cursed at me. I was not the instigator of violence. I was there to record news events that were making history. For all journalists covering the civil rights story through the 60s, it was exhausting, difficult, and often very dangerous for me. Above all, more troubling and emotional in a personal way because I am a Southerner too. Spider Martin was nicknamed Spider because he would crawl up in a tree and get up on a tall limb and photograph what was going on down below. He got the very best photographs. He was a native of Fairfield, Alabama, and he was familiar with racial uh, views prevalent in his state. And as he photographed near the Brown Chapel, AME Church in Selma, Alabama, Martin recalled, these Alabama state troopers are looking at me. I thought they were going to shoot me. They had been told by Governor Wallace that Spider Martin has had too many pictures in the Yankee press. Get him. A lady grabbed me by the arm and pulled me inside her apartment. She said, get yourself in here before they kill you. All of a sudden, I was inside and smelled soul food. She said, sit down and eat. I had turnip greens, black-eyed peas, pork chops, cornbread, and iced tea. I woofed it down and started to leave, but she said I should eat the banana pudding. 
I said I had to go, but looked out and saw that Dallas County posse deputy with that big gun. I ate the banana pudding. After Martin photographed a civil rights marcher wearing a jacket with Alabama goddamn written on its back, he spoke with the marcher and asked him what Alabama goddamn meant. He said it meant, Lord, these people have enslaved my people for 400 years. Damn them. Black Americans have associated photography with freedom for over 150 years. And these images resonate with special power, just as the photograph of, quote, whipped Peter, end quote, Gordon, a former enslaved laborer whose back was scarred by a whipping he received in 1863 on the Lyons Plantation in Louisiana. And just as the 1955 photograph of Emmett Till's mangled face that his mother Mamie Till insisted be displayed in its own casket open to let, quote, the world see what they did to my boy are seared into our memory, these images bear witness to the violence faced by courageous protesters. The memory of that violence was rekindled as we witnessed scenes of violence and murder in the Unite the Right Valley, the Right Rally in Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017. The 1955 photograph of Emmett Till was a searing image that inspired the civil rights movement that followed during the 60s. And people, black, white, old, young, Protestant, Catholic, and Jew, all of whom marched for freedom. 30% of the freedom riders were Jewish, many of whom were children of Holocaust survivors. Two of these children, Andrew Goodman and Mickey Schwerner, uh, and their fellow civil rights worker, James Cheney, were murdered near Philadelphia, Mississippi during Freedom Summer in 1964. We remember their photographs as they appeared on an FBI missing persons poster in 1964. The Ku Klux Klan used terrorist violence to intimidate civil rights workers and black families. Memorable examples of such violence include the 16th Street Baptist Church bombing in Birmingham, Alabama on September 15, 1963, when 15 sticks of dynamite planted by four members of the Klan exploded and killed four young girls and injured 22 others. Reverend Martin Luther King described the event <coughs> as one of the most vicious and tragic crimes ever perpetrated against humanity. The 60s were a momentous time for the civil rights movement in the American South and in the nation. These photographs are an inspiration to us today and to future generations as we continue to fight for justice and for all humankind. Thank you. Do you want to take questions or all right, if you have any questions, I'll Yeah, if you have any questions, if you'll just raise your hand and I'll come to you. 
Yes, but it's a question here and here. <coughs> Mr. Charlie, I think. As um, that was wonderful. I, I liked every, every um, minute of that talk. As Dr. King was formulating his uh, tactical approach to nonviolence or incorporating nonviolence, are you aware of any explicit dis uh, discussion by him or others saying, look, this is what we need. It's, it's more photogenic. The violence gets the message out. It's, the camera captures the violence. Do you, do you know if he talked explicitly about that? I don't know specifically, but I am absolutely sure that that was in the conversation. Both photographs and film, that was the beginning of evening news and the kind of dramatic reportage that we saw in the civil rights movement and in Vietnam. And it was devastating uh, to see that. And when people, it brought it into the living room of every American. And I am sh absolutely sure that Dr. King and his advisors, just like the SNCC leaders, were very much aware of the importance of letting people see, as did Mamie Till and Frederick Douglass. I mean, this whole link between photography and protest and freedom is an ongoing thing. And with George Floyd, we saw the most contemporary technology, a little iPhone that this woman who simply happened to be there turned on as he was dying. And that galvanized a global movement for Black Lives Matter in the same way that that photograph of uh, Emmett Till in his coffin just spread like wildfire. So it's hard to understand that until you begin to reflect on all this. And there's an arc historically from the invention of photography and the daguerreotype in the 19th century to the present, and it continues today. But all of us have the ability to do both photography and film in these little devices that we now, virtually every American of all ages has. And there's nothing like 9-11 in New York was the most photographed event probably ever. Everyone on the streets of New York turned up their camera and photographed and filmed it. And so the answer to your question, I would refer to uh, the editor uh, of the Martin Luther King papers, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Clay, uh, at Stanford University. And I can, I can give you his information. He'll know exactly where to look. There was a question here. Okay. Okay. Clay Carson is his name. As I listened and looked at what your program offers, it made me think about um, the controversy today about critical race theory, which I don't think I even understand or have been able to find out what the definition of it, because it seems to be kind of fluid. But I know that teachers are under a lot of duress about what they're supposed to do in the classroom. And that the classroom is how we teach history. And if you, are, if you cannot display or show this information is very concerning. But tell me what you think about this uh, controversy about critical race theory and how it fits in. Well, the question is about critical race theory. <clears throat> My wife, Marcy, and I were watching television this morning, and there is uh, a chef from Israel who has a world-class restaurant in New Orleans talking about how he is blending New Orleans and Jewish foods from his childhood. And then they segue to the recipes that Jewish people in the concentration camps, they couldn't cook, they couldn't eat those recipes, but they wrote them down as a memory of times when they were free. And his mother 
had such a book that the lady who cooked in their home in uh, Eastern Europe rescued when the family were taken to the camps. And he and his sister survived. And many years later, uh, this cookbook was given to the Holocaust Museum. And so Alain uh, Shea, the chef in New Orleans, went to the cookbook and was so moved by it that he began to make the recipes. Now, if, if it's not Black Lives Matter, it happens to be Jews. What are we gonna do? Take away the cookbook? Take away the Holocaust Museum? The African American Museum? What about the Museum of American History? Should we wipe that out? Because it has certain things in it that are offensive to certain people? What we are struggling to do is to embrace our history in every way. Like people, we've got warts that, you know, we prefer not to remember, but they're who we are. And we've got, as a nation, to embrace all of our people. And this is just 10 years of a long history of tough times that blacks have endured and continue to endure. They've been the victim of living while being black. That meant you couldn't eat, you couldn't go to school, you couldn't own a house. I mean, you were basically redlined out of life. And that was true for the Irish too. A lot of Irish were treated, you know, Irish and dogs and Jews and blacks are not welcome here, so signs would say. So we have a choice and the people, the voices that don't want to remember, they are in favor of burning books. And who are they to tell us when we have people like Claiborne Carson at Stanford who's devoted his life to one person's experience, Reverend King, in the way that Many people have devoted their lives to George Washington, to Abraham Lincoln. Uh, this is what learning is all about. When I was at NEH, we had what we call the pipeline of humanities, and this is what this is all about here. NEH would fund a small, maybe 10 or $20,000 grant to do research on a project. And then that scholar would finish and write the project and publish a book. The book would come out, and if it was well received, then teachers like teachers here at this college would get a copy and work it into their curriculum. And then the students would learn the new and exciting news from that part of their history and their world. And history changes all the time. We're constantly rediscovering. The same way that if you look at a Shakespeare play or at uh, a concert, uh, a Beethoven symphony, every generation will play it a different way and perform it a different way. And a historian will discover new books just like this cookbook and understanding the power of food in a community of people who are imprisoned and probably going to die, they were writing about food. That adds a whole new dimension. So when people want to write out history, they're moving in the wrong direction. They are welcome to do that if that's what they choose to do. We're not going to force them to read a book, but they cannot tell you and your teachers and your students not to do it. Because I can tell you, and you know this as well as I, you wouldn't be sitting here, that the keys to the highway, if you have children, and you want those children to be successful, to rise above what you are able to do and to have a better life, education is what that's all about. 
My brother was a farmer and a state senator who was a big advocate for education. And he put a lot of funding in Mississippi, which needed it and still does. People say to my brother, do you think you can cure educational problems just by throwing money at it? He would say, I don't know. It's never been tried before. <laughs> About time we put some money in it here and all over the nation because the teachers are preparing the next generation who are going to run this country. If they don't know how to speak Chinese, if they don't know the history of the Ukraine, if they don't know the struggles for civil rights, how are they going to do the future? Education will give security to your children and to your community. And I can tell you that this college campus is a catalyst for building the platform of education for your community. That's why Marcy and I are here. It's just as important as the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, as Yale University, as the great research universities of the world. And the most enduring institutions of the world, the first and oldest, is the Catholic Church. After the Catholic Church are the universities, Oxford and Cambridge and European universities, all of ours. UNC is the oldest public university in the nation. And believe me, it's going full blast. We just wrapped up a $5 billion fundraiser. Shortly after Marcy and I moved here 20 years ago, they were wrapping up the first, which brought in $4 billion. And someone told me, even without the drive for that, they would raise roughly that amount over four or five years because they have an engine of fundraising. And you have it here. This foundation is magnificent. You are preparing for the future. And for those who say they don't like a book, they, they, it's on the banned list, say, well, I certainly respect your view and... I don't want to force you to read any of those books, but do not tell our community how to run our schools. You are not qualified, and you're not building for the future. If you want to shut your children up and only give them whatever books you think are qualified, that's your choice. But it's not your right to stop education, to turn back the clock because the world is not turning back. The future will be in the hands of those who understand ideas. And that's what education is all about. It's not about teaching you to drive a tractor or teaching you just to be a lawyer. You have to be creative and you have to be able to move on your feet because this world is changing so fast I was talking with Stephen up there about the technology that thankfully worked today, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> and as you well know, when you have a problem, you go to your grandchild. That's who knows how to use this. And they are like fish to water, whereas I'm sort of limping along and using email, they're out in social networks. But if you can't master those worlds, and you're not challenged to the limit, then you're not being prepared. And if you want to look at where the hubs of New North Carolina are, it's around the universities, the community colleges. If you don't have an educational center, and it can be a high school, no matter what it is, it is where you want to put your support, both locally and statewide and nationally, uh, so that's a long-winded answer, but I, I, you know, I respect everyone's right to read the books they want to read or not read, but do not impose your vision of what should be banned on our future. Thank you. Do we have another question? Another question? 
I just had one bill, and uh, uh, first of all, I did want to say I forgot to announce that we are selling the books outside um, in the atrium, I Am a Man. So if you'd like to get one of those and for Dr. Ferris to sign it, please do uh, on your way out. But I did want to um, just ask you very quickly, the, uh, as I read your book, the um, photographer in Kentucky who took all the pictures at Lexington and he, he kind of took them during the civil rights movement there and puts the camera away and kind of forgot about them. And without those photographs, there would have been no visual documentation of the civil rights movement in Lexington. What have you got in your attic? What have you got on your, <laughs> on your phone? Um, just that pr local history is hard. And um, Emily can tell you, uh, David can tell you, because it, it is not documented like Dr. King, mm -hmm. and, um, and we need that. Any, any thoughts on that? Of yes, I have a lot of thoughts on that. <clears throat> when I was at NEH, we had an initiative called My History is America's History, and it's available. It's a booklet. It's free, and it tells you how to preserve photographs, how to go into your attic and look at family letters, at journals, photographs, films. And now they have, a in archiving, they have what they call born digital. So if your children, when they are our age, or your grandchildren, they're going to have most of their photographs and films will be digital. And the librarians of the future and now are accepting both the digital and the print materials. And those can go into a local library. They can go in our library, Wilson Library. Half of the photographs in our big exhibit, which was 150 out of 300, came out of Wilson Library. And we have just acquired two major photography collections, one by a North Carolinian, Burke Uzzle, who uh, is very famous, and another by a civil rights photographer, Roland Freeman. And, uh, but your family photographs are important because in the future, the more we can see, not narrowing it, but expanding the picture, the better we will be. And our library now has an initiative in Wilson Library to partner with local libraries and to help local libraries learn how to do digital work and things that they may need help with. So if any of you are interested in making contact, uh, Marcy and I will be happy, happy to put you in touch with Maria Estorino, who's our head of our university libraries. And she was at this exhibit in France, too. So all these are connected. And, and Mary worked on that project. She did a wonderful job of turning up rare photographs that were reviewed and put on the, on the walls in France and here. Were there any photographs from Goldsboro, Mary? I, I don't remember, but we, we turned up out of probably 100,000, 3,000 that the team we had, Mary and others, thought were really, and each of them would take a piece. So out of the 3,000 with our French friends, we narrowed that to 300. But I can tell you without knowing for sure that there are civil rights photographs from Goldsboro. And uh, even if we didn't find them, they're out there. And it, it's a massive amount of material. And this is sort of like a dipstick that tells you this is exciting, interesting material. Uh, but if you had someone who was specifically interested in Goldsboro, we could help them 
uh, look at collections both here and in uh, Chapel Hill and other places, the Smithsonian, Library of Congress. Uh, but if that's your mission, we'll help you realize it. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you, Thank Bill. You. Thank you, Dr. Ferris. We thank you for coming. Please join us tomorrow to hear another Dr. Ferris at 12 o'clock. Thank you, Mary. Mary Williams. Thank you. And Mary, I am so sorry. We were hoping you'd make it, and you yeah, did. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You, you made it just in time.